Thanks. So, um, last time, the day before yesterday, I was um, mainly discussing the concepts of mod transitions. Um, so far, in a single band model. And um, today, I will mainly cover conceptual aspects of orbital symmetric mod transitions, also connected with um, the phenomenon of quantum breakdown in heavy Fermi systems. And um, this will more or less cover all of uh, today's lecture and um, concrete experimental examples where those transitions might occur are referred to the last lecture tomorrow. Um, so the last thing I was discussing the day before yesterday were spin liquids and because this is so important for uh, what is to come, I will just repeat the few slides um, again and so let's jump into spin liquids. Um, so what I was telling you so far was that if I have a Heisenberg model on some regular lattice like this one, that by introducing, these are really just the slides I showed the day before yesterday, by introducing some term which competes with the standard nearest neighbor exchange and which suppresses antiferentic order, I will be able to get a paramagnetic state which can be visualized as a collection of signals on this lattice. And I am... Um, I argue that there are essentially two possible phases of these signals. One is a liquid phase, which is essentially an equal weight superposition of all possible dimer coverings of this square lattice. And this is what you would call a resonating valence bond liquid. And alternatively, you have a valence bond solid where the state breaks both rotation and translation symmetry. And then this here would be the dominant configuration of, of the dominant configuration in the ground state wave function. I also argue that these two states have very different character regarding their elementary excitations, namely in these RBB liquid, you can essentially separate these two spin one half objects out to infinity, which means the elementary excitations are deconfined spin-offs. Whereas in the valence bond solid, if you try to do the same game, you get a linear confinement potential, and hence um, these two objects are tied together and you have elementary spin one triplet excitations. So this would be the conventional scenario. But well, this is how far I got. Um, now, this is only cartoon pictures. You have to ask, are these now phases which are really realized for some, for some models? And you also have to ask, how do I describe these transitions? And let me just um, very briefly um, tell you what one would do in theory in order to describe um, this transition which I advertised in the transition from an antiferon magnet into a paramagnet. The first thing which comes to mind would be a type of lambda in spoke theory where you write down a field three for the order parameter. So this is what is written down here. So phi is supposed to be the antiferentic order parameter. So simply uh, measuring the standard magnetization at each site. And if you go to the continuum limit, you find this theory, which you would typically call a phi four model. And this, of course, has an L state. <coughs> this the expectation value of this phi is non-zero. It has a paramagnetic state where it is zero. And um, now, after what we have just learned, you can ask, of course, which parallel is this theory describing? And uh, this question is a bit subtle, and if you, if you think about this, um, and one way of thinking about this in a more, more theoretic fashion would be to start from the original spin model and use a coherent state um, representation for the spins, which includes barrier phases, and then working with this type of theory, then you realize that this here is the appropriate low energy theory in cases where barrier phases are unimportant. And one microscopic, and so barrier phases is essentially about the physics of spins, which, which um, perform along the imaginary time axis some, some motion along the unit sphere. And one microscopic realization where this applies, like where these barrier phases are unimportant, would be a model of, let's say, preformed dimers. So preformed pairs of spins one half. So this is here. Uh, an example which you would call a bilayer antiferon magnet, where each ball is now representing a spin one half, and there is a natural pairing of spins. And uh, <clears throat> in terms of theory for these barrier phases, it means that due to the natural pairing, the barrier phases uh, in each pair cancel each other. So this is what happens to leading order. And then you can get away with writing down this theory, which is a theory for the order parameter alone. And then the paramagnet, which is described here simply by the disordered phase of this 5 4 model is then a state which is simply described by having singlets on each natural pair in this state. And note that this is different from the valence bond solid I was advertising before, because the valence bond solid on the square lattice was breaking, was spontaneously breaking symmetries. This one here is not spontaneously breaking any symmetry. This is really a featureless part of that. 
Um, so this is what this theory is appropriate for. Now, there is an alternative way of dealing with things. And, and this is now using an alternative representation for the possible water parameter. And so one way of getting this is to introduce shrinker bosons for the original for the original spins. The alternative way to simply would be to introduce spin or fields representing the water parameter. And if you do something like this, then you realize that this representation here um, comes to the U1 gauge degree of freedom, which at the end means that if we write down the effective theory in terms of these Z objects, they have to be coupled to a U1 gauge field simply in order to account for the redundancy of this representation. And this can be done, and I will not describe any details of what this theory really means, but what this is here is a theory of these Z objects, which you now would properly call spin-ons, coupled to a gauge field. And the gauge field now is here A, it has space and time components. And again, this is to, to, to account for the, for the overcompleteness of the representation. And apart from this, there is also a mass term and a, and a quartic term here. And there is an action which describes the physics of the gauge field alone, which you can imagine is coming out from integrating our time and degrees of freedom. So this now here is an interesting theory to discuss. And in particular, if now this Z field acquires an expectation value, you get the same, the same male state as before. So in other words, the gauge field, actually, one can argue that the gauge field then doesn't play a role. This is like a, a type of Higgs mechanism. But if this Z field doesn't acquire expectation value, we again describe paramagnetic phase. But this turns out now to have an interesting base structure. Because there is this gauge field, which as written down here is a U1 gauge field, which has a gapless, which has gapless low energy mode. Like what was an artificial photon. And now we are describing here in principle a spin liquid of these spinons, which, have, which in addition has this, this photon degree of freedom. And this uh, is in some sense it corresponds to, to the cartoon picture for the RBB liquid I was, I was uh, proposing before, because here the elementary objects are the spin one half carrying object Z. In contrast, actually, to the fluctuations of the pi 4 theory, which I was advertising before, which has elementary spin 1 excitations, which are gapped in the time. <coughs> but this is a good starting point if you want to describe some of the spin liquids, and apparently you need to know about the gauge field theories and coupling of gauge fields to matter, which is something I will not want to dive into. Let me just tell you what the outcome of the corresponding analysis is. And what the outcome is, if you play this game and analyze this type of theory on the square lattice, you find that this spin liquid, which I was just advertising, is in fact unstable towards dimerization. Which means on a square lattice, it turns out that this valence bond solid state is always the realized state in such a model with frustrations, so in particular of the model I advertised, which has this ring exchange term on top of the, of the Heisenberg um, exchange. Um, but there is something interesting about the transition between the nail state and the valence bond solid, which goes under the name of deconfined criticality, which is a very interesting on its own, which I will not want to discuss here in detail. Um, if you instead play this game on a non-bipartite lattice, then other interesting things happen. In particular, um, the gauge symmetry is broken down to, to C2, and there is a C2 spin liquid. This is now about spinons coming to a C2 gauge field, which is potentially stable. In other words, in a triangle lattice, there is a possibility of having a spin liquid which really uh, uh, consists of now spinons, in the simplest case, gap spinons, like the one I advertised in my cartoon pictures, now coupled to a Z1 gauge, a Z2 gauge field. And um, those, what one can discuss other lattices also in 3D, and I'm not going into the details here. The interesting, the interesting upshot of this discussion is that typically those spin liquids, which have fractionalized excitations of spinon type, which I was discussing, also possess topological order in a well-defined sense in the language of these, of these um, matter fields coupled to gauge fields that need topological defects in the gauge field of suppressed. It also implies that if you put the system, let's say, on a torus, you will have a non-trivial degeneracy in the ground state from, from this uh, topological order. But these are various things which one can discuss further. For the moment, I just want to say that there are these spin liquids, and one can now ask, do we have microscopic examples for those? Because again, those will be important for my discussion on of, um, of orbital selective mod transitions. And um, there are a few which uh, I would call rigorously established, so with, with a varying degree of rigor. Um, there is a certain, I, sh I forgot to add citations here. There is, on the pyroflow lattice, there is a certain easy Eisenberg model, which in a certain limit actually turns, to be, turns out to be exactly solvable. This realizes such a 
which is a gapless uh, liquid with, uh, with a U1 gauge field. Then for the triangle that is called the Bimal model, um, this is work of Messner and Sondi. It has been shown by convincing numerical simulations that such a gapped RBB liquid with C2 gauge structure is actually realized. And there's another um, example which has been mentioned already, namely a detired model, like a compass model or a honeycomb that is, which realized a gapless Majorana liquid. I put this in quotation marks because this is in some sense a, a trivial liquid because you can really represent it by three fermions without gauge field. Um, so, so this is, this is uh, in some sense perhaps too simple, but it's still interesting because um, it's an exact result of the model. Now, this is still not extremely realistic when you want to compare it to experiments. Um, there are now other systems which I would call good candidates for spin liquids, uh, which are more close to experiments. One is the Heisenberg model on the Kagome lattice. I think that was recent work by Stephen White with BMRG, um, showing that this is very likely in a spin liquid phase. And there are other examples here, and in particular, I want to point out these two, which are about Hubbard models, where um, the following physics happens when you, so Hubbard models, as I discussed in my first lecture, and there uh, the situation is such that when you increase U, you run, you, you come to a mod transition where the metallic vapor disappears, but then on the mod side, you don't get an order antiferromagnet, but before, which you actually get at large U, but it's an intermediate regime of U, you get a spin liquid. And let me just flash here this particular result for the honeycomb that is Harvard model published in this paper in Nature last year, where this is now a type of phase diagram, but this is the axis U over T. So this is really Harvard model of honeycomb that is no further, let's say, um, no further twists, so just nearest neighbor hopping and Harvard U. And what you are supposed to see here is that at large you get an antiferromagnetic phase, which is a simple, standard, nailed state, which, I mean, honey, honeycomb is unfrustrated, so this is, has to come out at large U. But in the immediate U, you get a spin liquid phase, and this curve here is actually showing the size of the spin gap of this particular axis. But there is an intermediate spin liquid phase between the metal, actually the semi metal on the honeycomb that is, and the antiferromagnet. Which is in blue. In blue, in blue is um, the spin, let me see. Um, this is the single particle gap, as P is the single particle gap as extracted from the Monte Carlo simulations. So um, all these, I mean, th th there are significant error bars here, so I guess the most likely scenario is that the onset of the blue is the same as the onset of the yellow, but there are error bars involved, so this is uh, it's a quite complicated type of one Monte Carlo calculation. But so the, 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 the color corollary from this is that it's such Hubbard models where you can add frustration, um, it's likely that at small U there is a metallic phase, and at large U without frustration there's an antiferromagnetic insulator. But if you put frustration, then there may be an intermediate regime, which in principle might also extend all the way down to U equals infinity, where you have a quantum spin liquid. And again, triangle lattice is likely here, where you cut through this spin liquid regime, carbon lattice, here the spin liquid may fill up all the way to U equals infinity. And again, the only reason for me why I why I dwell on this is uh, this type, the existence of these types of spin liquid will be important for what comes down. Okay, now with this, I'm essentially here, and I can now go to discuss orbital selective mod transitions, orbital selective mod phases. And as I announced, these are prime examples of non Fermi liquid phases in dimensions larger than one. So let's just briefly recall what we think we know about non Fermi liquids. Um, so, apparently, non Fermi liquid is not a very specific term. Usually, it's used for a metallic state which violates the typical, um, typical results for, for Fermi liquid behavior, and it does so in some asymptotic regime, so hopefully down to zero temperature. And uh, we can ask, where do we find this experimentally? And um, it's quite often found near quantum critical points, and I will um, say a few more words in the next slide. It's actually also found in metals of sizable disorder. And here, um, there are theories explaining deviations from, from Fermi liquid behavior. It's found in cuprates, and I will make a few remarks about, the, about possible scenarios in, in, in my last lecture tomorrow. It's also found in clean metals like MNSI, which is a very interesting topic. That's a, that's a chiral magnet, um, which has non Fermi liquid behavior for unknown reasons. But uh, for what follows, I will mainly focus first on quantum critical points, and then again discuss orbital selective mod phases, because 
This is something which does not appear on this list, and of course we are looking for experimental realizations. So quantum criticality, I'm not sure whether any case I've like this already appeared here over the last days, but I mean this is what everybody has seen. So we have a system which can be tuned through some quantum phase transition by some non stable control parameter, and the idea is that the quantum ground state is unconventional at this quantum critical point, which then upon raising temperature, actually um, York was showing a phase diagram like this for the field. So um, we just saw it. So the idea is that now upon raising temperature, there is some interesting uh, physics going on in this quantum critical regime up here, and in metals this might be connected to non fermi behavior. Um, now, there is one nice example, one out of many actually, in the family of heavy fermion compounds. Um, this is this material, serum copper gold, where you see a phase diagram here. This is temperature, and this is the uh, gold concentration with the doping axis. This has an antiparticle ordered phase. This is a metal. And um, there is a Fermi liquid regime at small x, and there is a quantum vertical point here. And what you see in this panel is um, specific heat. And uh, so, specific heat now is a function of temperature um, for various gold concentrations. So, you cut the phase diagram at various slices here in vert vertical direction. And if you just focus on the curve corresponding to the critical concentration, x equals 0.1, which is now showing in blue here, then you see a logarithmic divergence of the specific heat coefficient, which um, should be constant in the metal, so that's an apparent violation of Fermi liquid behavior. And uh, this is something which um, actually is not fully understood. And uh, this behavior here is one of the reasons why, in the context of heavy fermion systems, people started to think about uh, condo breakdown phase transitions, which is what I will discuss next. So I should just mention that the standard theory for the onset of antiferromagnetism in metals, which is essentially an all parameter based theory, which goes with the name of Hertz and might be classified as a Landau Ginsburg Wilson theory, is not capable of describing this logarithmic divergence, at least not if you say that this is a 3D antiferromagnet and we are supposed to talk about the onset of 3D antiferromagnetism in metals. Okay, now um, if you just think about phenomenology again, and we ask what types of non Fermi liquids can we have, and how could they occur in, in phase diagrams, and how would they, how are they conceptually to be classified? We can think about various things. So one thing is we could ask uh, where does the non Fermi liquid behavior in the phase diagram exist? Apparently, there is a possibility that the non thermal liquid regime narrows as t goes to zero. This is what you would have in such a quantum critical regime, where non thermal liquid, or I should perhaps go to this phase diagram, but non thermal liquid would be restricted to this quantum critical fan out here. But this is one possibility. But it also, would also be possible in principle that there is non thermal liquid behavior of an extended regime, then corresponding to a stable non thermal liquid phase. And um, then, of course, when talking about talking about explanations, there are conceptual distinctions. One is whether this non Fermi liquid behavior is only about a crossover between some asymptotic regimes which are well understood, or, or whether it's really an, an asymptotic non Fermi liquid regime in the sense of something which is in theory can extend over an arbitrary large temperature range. And then if we think about theoretical description, then we also have to discuss whether we can describe this non Fermi liquid in terms of quasi particles. Fermionic quasi particles, or not. And um, the Landau Ginsburg Wilson theory, which I just mentioned for antiparticle transition in a 3D metal, essentially corresponds to these situations here. We have quantum criticality, the non Fermi liquid regime narrows. And um, there, is, there is quasi particle, there are quasi particles, at least if we are above the upper critical dimension, which we are in a 3D metal. But the scattering is undermined. Yes, can you define for this purposes existence of quasi particles as in peak whose uh, position is well defined relative to its width in the at the, yes, the pole of the length function? That, that's, uh, that, 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 there are still subtleties now because because we have to discuss whether we require this everywhere on the Fermi surface or not. But uh, yes, this is this is a good working definition. And of and course, of course, in, in some sense you could also you could also say. Can I get away with a theory which starts from quasi particles and then incorporates that scale, scattering effects perturbatively, which is the case in Hertz Miller's? Or do I need to do something else? Um, but the operational definition is, of course, do I get to have sharp quasi particle peaks somewhere? 
And is it fair to say that in that case, uh, the divergence here of the T arises from some other modes of the inclusive particle? Because, you know, in Hertz Millis, it's basically a bosonic part that gives me something in C over T. Um, that is actually a matter of a matter of description. So if you if you subscribe to Hertz Millis, then of course you integrate our fermions and then you get a, you get a you get singular correction to specific heat. In 2D they are log and 3D is just square root. And those apparently arise from bosons. Um, there is actually an alternative way of, of doing things, namely you can do a Hertz Millis type approach, keeping fermions and then looking for renormalization bundle parameters. And then if you integrate over everything, you get, at least in 3D, this is safe, because in 3D we are well above the upper dimension. You also get the square root, the square root of t, which then actually, um, the square root of t correction to specific heat, which then is, is contained in anomalous temperature dependence of your lambda parameters. So in this sense, um, whether you integrate out fermions or whether you integrate out bosons gives the same physics. I mean, that's, that's of course not unexpected. Um, but the canonical way of doing this would be to put all singular stuff in the bosons. But um, again, this is not, not required. But in any case, you can get away with well-defined quasi particles in the theoretical description. Now, the kind of breakdown transition which I will which I will advertise in the following is something where actually no quasi particles exist. Um, so this will be about critical Fermi surfaces, and I will try to describe what I mean by that. And most interestingly, I will also talk about this orbit and selective noise phases, which then is a phase where actually we get non fermi liquid behavior over an extended range of parameters. So this is really a stable phase of matter, which violates fermi liquid behavior. And in a well defined sense, you will see that quasi particles exist, at least in the versions of this orbit and selective noise phase, which I have something to say about. Um, but there is animal scatter. Okay, and I will make this clear in the following. So let's start with the perspective of heavy fermion systems. And um, a, a one question of, of posing, well, one way of posing an interesting question is, when it comes to, let's say, orbit and selection of mod physics, is how to counteract screening of local moments. So why is this a good way of asking the question? Namely, you have seen in, the previous, in my previous talk that close to the mod transition, we have the phenomenon that at high energy scales, local moments are forming. This is what DMFT actually describes well. And at low energies, those are screened by some version of the conduit effect, which in DMFT is very well defined because you are solving the impurity problem. But it's very clear that there is a two-stage process. High energy is a local moment is forming, which again at low energies is screened. And this, this seems to be something generic to strongly correlated methods. And now, if we are looking for something uh, which this is not an ordinary Fermi liquid at the end, we somehow have to counteract the screening because the screening is what ultimately gives you Fermi liquid behavior. And the question is, how can we do this? And I will first discuss the heavy fermion way of doing it. And so heavy fermions is about such a system. We have local moments, so these are typically 4F electrons, and we have an addition conduction electrons. You will see a Hamiltonian on the next slide, so a quantum lattice model. And um, the heavy Fermi liquid, which in principle we understand qualitatively well, is obtained by um, a generalization of the condo screening, namely where these local moments here, these degrees of freedom, are eaten up by the conduction electrons. That's simply a lattice version of the condo effect, which I was talking about before. Then you get composite quasi particles and a nice Fermi. Um, and so, but this is not the only thing which can happen. So here again is a quantum lattice Hamiltonian, um, conduction electrons and some coupling to the local moments. And but there is Apart from the condo screening, there's another effect, namely there could be magnetic ordering of these moments, this is already what this picture suggests, now mediated by r to y interactions. Then the canonical phase diagram, which one can draw a temperature here, and here the ratio between these two energy scales, namely condo and r to y, is that there is a heavy Fermi liquid where the moments are screened, and there is magnetic order on the other side, because here is where r to y dominates. But this is the canonical phase diagram going back to Donia from 1970-something. And um, when it comes to criticality for its heavy fermion metals, we talk about this particular transition, which experimentally seems to behave in an fashion. fashion. Um, before I continue, let me just remind you of one interesting thing which I already, sorry, which I already noted here, namely Lattice's theorem makes a statement about the volume of the Fermi surface in the heavy Fermi liquid. Namely, despite the fact that the F electrons now in the microscopic model I was writing down simply appear as spins, 
they still contribute to the Fermi volume, and the statement is that the Fermi volume is essentially proportional or given by it. It's just a trivial proportionality factor here. The total number of electrons, where this is now um, conduction electrons plus number of local moments in the unit itself. In other words, these spins behave as electrons in the heavy Fermi liquid. And um, actually, they are, this can prove, be proven in non determinative fashion, uh, which was done in this paper by Bernard Chicago. And so this here is a phase which obeys Lattimer's theorem in precisely this sense. Now, um, if we have this phase diagram and we think about this phase transition, then um, one thing which uh, one can easily realize is that the order parameter theory of this antiparticle transition, which I was mentioning several times, that this essentially assumes that there is only magnetic degrees of freedom which order at this transition here but they assume that the, this heavy Fermi liquid remains intact across the phase transition. In other words, the screening, which eats up the local moments here, extends across this transition, and then this transition is only about the onset of magnetic order and the metal, nothing else. Now, this, was, uh, this is what essentially enters the theory, because as we emphasized, this is a theory which only works with the order parameter. But, um, so people speculated that this uh, is not the only thing which can happen. And a clean way of thinking about other possibilities is to eliminate this magnetically ordered phase from the phase diagram. And I told you just before how you can do that. You introduce frustration in the local moment cycle. And then the phase diagram, which I'm now advertising, looks like this. It is the same phase diagram, temperature and ratio of condo interaction and this non-local optical y interaction. The same heavy Fermi liquid as before. But here is now a new phase, which um, we have dubbed fractionalized Fermi liquid a few years ago, and this is identical to the orbital selective mod phase, which I will discuss um, later on. And this is now an interesting phase where um, we have essentially the coexistence between electrons and a fractionalized spin liquid. So just, just pictorially, we can imagine the following. We start from this Hamiltonian, again described in this type of system. And since you want to describe this corner of the phase diagram, let's just start from only discussing this local moment interaction. Note that I've now put here an explicit exchange interaction between the local moments actually to ease the discussion. And in, in which sense does the theorem violate? What uh, takes... Wait a second. Please. Wait a second. So, um, um, two slides. Three. Okay. Um, so we start from this local moment cycle. In the local moment cycle, I play exactly the same game I told you before. I have local moments on a regular lattice. I assume I add something which frustrates magnetic order and I get a resonating valence from liquid state. And then I now put back conduction electrons. And um, since this, this spin liquid was a stable phase of matter to begin with, and if I make the coupling to the conduction electrons small, then these two things, a spin liquid and the Fermi surface of the conduction electrons, can happily coexist. But this is, of course, different if I would just have three spins here, then these three spins would be immediately screened. So I have something to do count, to counteract the screening, and this is the formation of the spin liquid. And this works at zero temperature, provided that such spin liquids exist, and I spent just the beginning of this talk and also convince you that they exist. So this is the stable phase of matter, and this is the phase which is realized here. And again, this has this two-component nature. It consists of conduction electrons and a fractionalized spin liquid, so a state of local moments which doesn't break any symmetries and has fractionalized excitation. And now this violates Lattimer's theorem in a very precise way, namely the, the Fermi surface consists of conduction electrons alone. In other words, the Fermi volume is now not given by the total number of electrons, but only by the number of conduction electrons, as written here. So it's not given by NC plus 1. Note that we are discussing a system which has one spin per unit cell, but it's given by NC. Well, Lattinger's theorem is violated exactly by one. It's an arbitrary violation, Lattinger's theorem, but exactly by one. This will also be important um, for later discussions. And the claim is this is a stable phase of matter, and all what it needs is essentially, in a pragmatic fashion, it needs a spin liquid to which we weakly couple conduction electrons. If you couple conduction electrons strongly, then of course, condo screening will kick in and will screen the local moments in a metallic fashion. But here, in this phase, the local moments screen themselves by non-local interactions leading to this non trivial state. Why uh, is the fragmentalized world used for this way? Because the spin liquid, as I was advertising before, has spin-on excitations. 
So the, so the, the local moment sector has unconventional expectations. So this is the, that's the reason. So is that realistic? Because what you have been describing as being a system which are, uh, which are uh, still liquids are cases where there is no uh, pollution. It's a static state. Here you are having both uh, types uh, of uh, electrons at the same time. Also, so that the, the image that you gave, I, I agree with the description, but uh, I wonder whether this kind of situation is uncomfortable. It's of course, I mean, you can ask which systems are, are good candidates for this, and this will be my topic tomorrow. So, um, but, I mean, in the first minutes I just spent some effort to convince you that those physics exist at all, and we now have definite proof that they exist, and we now need systems where those can coexist with conduction lattice. So we need conduction lattice systems where the local moments are sitting on some frustrated lattice, and there are candidates for this, and I will discuss this later. Can I ask the same question? Does every spin liquid fractionalize? That is a, um, okay, so that is actually the question what you call spin liquid. I mean, so I, I was not absolutely precise in my definition because if you just say a spin liquid is a paramagnetic state which doesn't break symmetries, then of course this simple, this simple state which forms preformed singlets in the bilayer magnet, according to this definition, is also a spin liquid. Well, let's say a spin ladder is also a spin liquid, according to this definition. And that's of course not fractionalized. Now, if you restrict, if, if you are more precise and say you have just one electron, one spin, one half per unit cell, then I guess the current belief is that all paramagnetic states which don't break symmetries in such a situation have fractionalized excitations. But I guess there's no form of proof. But those spin ladder has apparently spin one per unit cell, then there's no fraction. Um, Again, there are two. There are, there are different types of spin liquids. There are spin the liquids which have gapped excitations. Can you repeat those, the question? I'm sorry. Can you repeat uh, the question? I guess the question was whether whether the spin liquids are gapped or gapful, ah. um, and uh, both can occur. Both can occur. We know of fully gapped spin liquids. The Z2 spin liquid on the triangle that is we know is fully gapped, but there are also gapless spin liquids, and there may be there may be a spin gap but there may be gapless signal excitations coming from the artificial photon, and there may also be gapless speedful and spinless excitations. This is what people call algebraic spin liquids. And from your point of view, from point of view of the larger theorem relation, uh, do they behave similarly or differently? If this spin liquid is a stable phase of matter, and if I can couple conduction electrons to it with some finite coupling without changing the nature of this phase, they behave in a similar fashion. Of course, no temporal thermodynamics will be different, naturally. But um, the violation of the theorem will be the same. Okay, so we have the interesting situation here that we have a second order phase transition that's the claim where the Fermi volume jumps. And I guess I will be running out of time, so I will not demonstrate to you how this works. So, which means I just jumped over a mean field description of this. In the and second order, or it's different transition? Uh, this is really second order, and the way. No, not like this. No, it's not like this. Okay. This is. Not like the shoots and okay, so I, I could discuss this, but I will I will not. Um, but the upshot is that what happens here at this second order transition is that in some sense one gets a critical Fermi surface. Maybe if you approach the, the phase transition from this side, the crazy particle weight goes to zero, and the jump in the occupation number is replaced by a power law singularity like in the one d liquid. And the same actually happens when you approach this thing from the other side. But the idea that here at this particular state you have a contour in momentum space which defines a Fermi surface, but the quasi-particle weight is zero everywhere. So in this sense, we don't have a, 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 a we, we don't have sharp quasi-particles. But I should admit that there is no really well-developed theory for such a state. So um, there have been some scaling arguments for this, but there is no well-developed microscopic theory. We can also briefly discuss the properties of this quantum critical regime here, and for a particular mean field plus fluctuation version, which have been out, which have been worked out a number of papers listed here, um, we know a few properties. For instance, interestingly, we find the specific heat goes like T dot T, as seen in some of the heavy Fermi experiments, and there's also a violation of wiedemann franz law, essentially because um, this the liquid component both here and here carries heat, no charge. And because in this particular version, actually, the spin liquid is gapless, uh, this holds down to zero temperature. Okay, how many minutes do I have left? 
Okay, so let's 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 try to compress the rest in like two minutes. Um, so this was a heavy fermion view on orbital selective point transitions. Now let's take a different view. Let's take a multi-band Hubbard model. So let's let's take a two-band Hubbard model. So just a two-band version of what I was discussing the day before yesterday. And let's ask the question: If I have two bands, can I have a mod transition in the two Hubbard bands at different values of the coupling strength, different values of U? <coughs> Um, so this is essentially written here. Suppose I have two inequivalent bits, two, two inequivalent bands. Can I have two distinct mod transitions in each band? And the answer is yes. And what I'm now showing you here are DNF results. What you are supposed to see here is a quasi parting weight as function of u in a particular version of the two-band Hubbard model. Details don't matter. What you are supposed to see is that this is the quasi particle weight in one band vanishing at one value of u. That's the quasi particle weight in the second band vanishing at a different value of u. Whether it's an intermediate phase or one band is metallic, the other one is insulated. So this is shown in the spectral functions over here. And I don't recall from which of these four papers I've taken this, this picture. Probably experts in the audience know. Um, but so this is now the weight spectral function in two bands at different values of u. And so this is spiky because it comes from exact diagonalization. Um, but uh, what you see is that here, at this particular intermediate value of u, the quasi particle p here has gone. But here, in this band, it's still there. So this is orbital selective point phase, or at least the DMFP version of it. And this here is another representative phase diagram of some now a three band Hubbard model. Um, and one should emphasize that an important ingredient in getting this phase in DMFT is Wundt's coupling. So one needs to have a Wundt's coupling between the different orbitals. And uh, I will say in a second why this is important. And what you see here is a phase diagram where Wundt's coupling is here, U, the Coulomb interaction is here. And you have a metal, you have a full mod insulator. Note that the total filling here in these three bands is like four. But there is an orbital selective mod phase, OSMT is orbital selective mod phase, covering a large range of the phase diagram at finite values of this, of this Wundt interaction. And um, you can ask how in DNFT can I actually get such a phase, because in DMFT we map onto an impurity problem, and an impurity problem has condo effect. And the answer is that this OS, this orbital selective point phase maps onto ferromagnetic condo problems. And so ferromagnetic condo problem doesn't have screening, we know this. And this is the way how you can how you can avoid screening in this setting of DMFT. So this is now not about non-local effects, but it's about the local effect. Then the ferromagnetic coupling between the two between the different orbitals. And therefore, this Wundt interaction is, is crucial. Okay. Now, let me just spend the last, like, minus one minute by discussing the, 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 the fate of this orbital selective mod phase, which I just advertised. Namely, I just argue that this orbital selective mod phase arises from this orbital selective mod transition, so this removes one band from the Fermi surface. And apparently, the resulting phase is neither a Fermi liquid. It's not a Fermi liquid because it doesn't fulfill Atticus theorem. Um, there's just one band missing, so the electron count doesn't, doesn't match. But it's also not a mod insulator because there's one metallic band, so it's clearly a metallic non Fermi liquid. And there are local moments because there are insulating bands, and we have learned that large U produces local moments, which in this case are non screened. Then, of course, if you want to go to low temperatures, and if you want to establish this as a stable phase of matter, you have to ask what is the fate of those moments at low temperatures? And then, actually, you have to discuss physics beyond DMFT, because we now really have the same situation as I discussed yesterday for the single band situation, where the insulator, the mod insulator in DMFT is, of course, just a bad approximation, because there's a residual entropy of log 2. The same applies here, if you just think about DMFT, and the way to get rid of the entropy is either magnetic order, or a fractionalized spinning. And if you, if you subscribe to this point of view, then, of course, you see that these two are really the same thing. Mm -hmm. With the difference that in this multi-band Hubbard situation, <coughs> there is a large energy scale to begin with, namely the, the Wundt's rule interaction, which um, suppresses screening already at large energies. But at low energies, the to, to ultimately stabilize the orbit selective mod phase, one needs um, non-local effects, and one needs this frustrated and each moment interaction. Mm -hmm. So I guess with this, I'm essentially at the end, the rest can come.
your in your multiband Hubbard model, you had one band that that gapped before the other one did. What determines which one goes first, if anything? Uh, you're still referring to these particular results here. Yes. But this, um, if I recall correctly, in this particular study, um, the two bands had different bandwidth. So, I mean, for in, in, in principle, it's a parameter um, T over U, so kinetic energy or bandwidth over Hubbard interaction. So, if you prepare the band to two different bandwidths, then this is one thing which does the job. You could also imagine different U's in the two bands, but it doesn't matter. So, Actually, if you would put one bandwidth to zero, then the Third building. That's a you had a convalescent model, paramagnetic convalescent model, for instance. Right? So that's a would be a question. Is the paramagnetic convalescent model also an orbital selective mod phase? Well, um, now it, it, it gets the terminology. I, I, I think um, the real the real non-fermi liquid nature of this phase, which I was advertising, can only be made precise if there is no symmetry breaking at the end, so at the low temperature limit. That's why I was emphasizing this fractionalized spin liquid. Once you have symmetry breaking and the ferromagnetic quantum lattice model will order magnetically, at least on most lattices, um, then Latinger's theorem works differently, right? Because you, you have to, your, if you have symmetry breaking, translation symmetry breaking, you have to backfold your bands, your Brillouin zone gets smaller, and then there is no distinction between what is called large Fermi surface and small Fermi surface. So either including or not including the local moments. And then uh, this state is no longer non Fermi liquid. So the precise way of defining the non-Fermi liquid behavior here is really about the violation of Latinger's theorem. So this is at least one precise way I know of. And this requires that there is no translation to liquid. More questions? Um, I know examples come tomorrow, but I've, I've heard in the context of the bilayer sponsor root planet that some people speak of common physics. Um, do you know the example? And if yes, could it be understood in the, in the, the picture of the orbital side of mass position? By layers, once you root the name, you mean the 2, 3, 3, 2, 7, 3, 2, 7 is a metamagnetic transition? Yes. Um, well, this is the electrons. I'm not really sure whether it's justified to talk about quantum physics there. This is an example That's which will not appear tomorrow because I don't think this is a good representative of this type. So it's a very interesting material, but I believe physics is somewhat different from what I described. Okay. Yeah. I wonder whether. This case is very important because you have the strong coupling between the two types of orbitals. If we are thinking of the electrons, uh, the coupling is very strong. Uh, you can map this problem onto a, sim a much simpler problem if you uh, consider the case where the magnetic moments are independent of the driving force for the, for the conductivity. Uh, let's uh, consider a case where you have uh, uh, if you, uh, when you have you have local moments which are uh, very weakly coupled to mm -hmm. the to the net. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, would you still see the sign of that somewhere? Sign of what? Of the, uh, of the fact that you have uh, one case where the local moments are formed and coupled extremely weakly. In other words, let's take the viewpoint. You have cases where you can put impurities which are magnetic in the intermediate layer. And they couple very weakly to the to the CO2 plate, but they still couple a little bit. So, would you expect a sign uh, uh, of this coupling somewhere to appear at the real temperature? For instance, I mean, we have to. We would have to specify what those local moments are doing. So let, let me just. I mean, as the first part of the answer, let me just emphasize that here in this corner of the phase diagram, it's it's realized precisely what you described. This is local moments which are weakly coupled to conduction electrons. And the local moments form spin liquid, and that is what, I, what, what, what I've been talking about. Now, um, in, in, in yours, in, in this, so we would have to say what the local moments are doing. So what is, of course, what will be generic in some sense is that at intermediate temperatures, there will be strong scattering, potentially strong scattering um, of the conduction electrons on these local moments, spin flip scattering, which produces non fermi liquid like resistivity. Um, that's of course one of the signatures of, of all this. Now what ultimately happens at low temperatures requires to specify what these local moments are and how they interact. So in the experiments they just form. So it's there that you, you know that the uh, gadolinium or, or anything that you put in, in between the layers give you a nail off. But you, you are still in a situation where you have uh, two-band model. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Which are, which are so try to discuss this. 
We'll try to discuss in some detail tomorrow, but you, you see, I've, I've been careful in discussing the, the zero temperature physics first and to establish the stability of this phase. Of course, there are interesting, interesting finite temperature crossovers which actually depend on whether we are more in the condolatus situation. So where we have just this non zero interaction which counteracts screening, or whether we are in this hover situation where a strong winds will come. Because this changes the finite temperature crossovers. So, do I correctly understand that this is diagram is weighted instead of computed? Sorry? And is this diagram then computed? I mean, this, one. this one here? Or just for the weight? Because, I mean, it's, it's this, nice. this looks too nice to be calculated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, I, went, I, jumped, I jumped over this over this particular slide here where we have a specific mean field theory with fluctuation corrections where we can compute this. But, but this is all this, uh, okay, so, so if you say remove from the uh, just forget about this, right? Mm -hmm. Then on the right of this zero, right, in the critical point, right, you are going to get the point of state, right? Or two, right? Because presumably you... I can, I can, I can write down the mean field theory where I get a spin liquid instead. No, no, you just, you just have transition. Okay, you need to something for it, right? But you need to suppress this order by screen, right? So, so, by screen. No, again, the order is suppressed by non-local effects which convert the antiferromagnetic into spin liquid. That's the whole point of this phase. It's no, not no, 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 not the left, the right. So suppose you can do one point, right? Just, just to get to that. Um, and then... This is the transition from... So you need to stay to some order state. Right? I mean, this, but this axis here is precisely where I switch, where I increase the, increase the condo company. So in other words, I, I would have to put another axis. Of course, we can discuss the transition between the spin liquid and more anti ferromagnet, but this is not what I'm talking about here. But this is this axis here is really about increasing condo screening. So if you if you ask me, forget about condo screening, then you then then I am no longer on this axis. Okay. I need to I need to add, add, add another axis. What I was wondering about is whether this point is not going to fall to some in this case. Um, I will discuss some generalized phase diagram which includes both this transition and the magnetic transition tomorrow. So, just wait. So, I think I understand your use of the term non-fermi liquid in the model, but if I were doing an Arpens experiment, could I tell the difference? Um, in Arpens, in this from liquid phase, the difference would be that um, if you would see all Fermi surfaces and you know how many electrons you have. You no, but nobody tells me how many electrons I have. Cuprates, you, you know how many electrons you have. And you don't see a large Fermi surface under the cuprates. So. But do you want to apply this to the cuprates? I will. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, I look forward to it. Yeah. So, yeah. but this, uh, sorry, but this, this, this is, a, this is the, the solid type of answer one can give, right? So, so in our case, the only thing, because this, this has sharp crazy particles. Yes, I understand. So and you have to know the number of scatter, electrons after scatter of the spins. So, so Lattinger, by Lattinger's theorem, is the group. Right. Follow-up question to Peter, but you decide. Well, if, if it's just a continuation. It's just a question whether the height of the peak, because you said that essentially the Landau parameters will change, whether Z of T will show me something in that phase, if you, do, if you look at our case. Z of Based on the weight of the quasi particle peak in Arpus, whether Well, I mean, the argument would apparently be that if you raise temperature into the quantum particle regime, quasi particles will disappear. But particular parallel? I don't know. Um, since we don't have a really good theory for that, I, 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 so, I mean, there will be some power law, but yeah, there are no good predictions. Yes, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, so, I mean, like, if I understood correctly, the way you summarize the, the fraction of Fractional state is by introducing the geometric perturbation, mm -hmm. right? And some uh, mm -hmm. change between the local moments. Yes. And now when you increase the decay to the right, you are also increasing the decay y direction. So mm -hmm. in principle, you could have a transition from the fractionalized from a liquid to a normal state and from the orbital state to the. So, so, so since you are talking about this, let me just see what I can do quickly. So, I mean, you're right, of course. So, this was, was a case diagram I wanted to show. So um, this here is now a phase diagram where I have the same axis as before, and you are right. I'm, I'm so to say, I'm assuming that I can tune these two parameters independent of each other, which is not strictly true. Um, but so I can add another axis, which is frustration, and then I get, and so here I have a Fermi liquid where condo screening is operated, and here with large frustration and less condo screening, I get the fractionalized Fermi liquid that's Eto star, which I was advertising. 
And down here, you get the standard local moment and decode thing. And there are two transition lines. One is this exotic one, where you get fractionalization. And another one, which is about the onset of magnetic order, there is even room for an intermediate fractionalized antiferromagnet, which may or may not be stable depending on details. So the 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 yeah. Yes, so th this is in principle what, what comes out when you really put these two axes, which probably was what you were heading for. That's one and that's your temperature. This is zero temperature, yes. And what is what is rational for the this is a, this is a, a so in the simplest in the simplest incarnation it's 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 one where the Boltzmann modes can be spin one half. I'm not this this has not been I'm not aware of any model where the stability of such a phase has been proven, but in principle you can imagine that something like this happens. It can actually also have regular Boltzmann modes, but 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 still non-trivial gauge structure to it. So let's say Boltzmann modes plus an artificial photon or something. But uh, this is rather exotic and I'm not claiming that this is relevant for any experiment. But this just naturally appears if you have these two transition lines, I mean, to get four phases. And these are the four phases. So, in a multi lens system, once you turn on the interactions, so you create all these new states, all these singlets, can some of them just be Zangrest singlet with the hybridization instead of strongly Shanghai singlets refers to something very specific in uh, three bands. Let's of the hybridization and color interaction they both play up together to give me a serious test. Um, I guess we, we should discuss this question later. This, this will be too. So the last question is, yeah, just coming back to the definition of what the plumbing method. I'm confused for the following reason. If I get the two band situation that you showed, two different band and I don't put a wind through coupling, but I have an uh, inter-orbital and intra-orbital coulomb direction which are inter I can, of course, come to a phase in a specific language version of time where one band is fertilized and the other one is not. So you would, in your definition, I think, call this non permeated because the Latin theorem only has one, one band of uh -huh. However, if you look at the, uh, the low energy behavior, you have perfectly so the energies, you would measure the and so on. In the energy. Oh, that's a trivial model so that you can solve by hand, actually, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so this, is, this, this is a fine-tuned model. So, um, yeah, you so would, I mean, yeah, you would measure perfect family yeah. right? But you wouldn't find this in nature. I mean, it's a fine-tuned model, apparently. And it's it. Uh, so, I'm also, I mean, I'm also not sure if you could take that and make one yeah. gap and one not, because you have intraorbital repulsion that's equal to your in, inter interorbital repulsion that's equal to your intraorbital repulsion. Yeah. So they're coupled. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can have one you can. to infinity, for instance. You take one to infinity okay. and you're sure there's one electron there that's not coupled to the rest of the world. So. But you don't have to know. There's some ratio where you go. Okay, I think I, we should move forward. So.